Hey, it's Luke without a darts. This is the build guide for the Proton Pack. It's worth noting right off the bat that this is for version three. You can find your version down here on the bottom. So keep in mind that there could be subtle changes if you've bought this down the road and if you're watching this in six months to a year or several years after this releases. I'm gonna show you how to build one all the way from these parts and these tools that you see here. I'm gonna run you through everything you need to know to get this set up. There are several other reference videos that I will mention in the video, and those are on the product listings themselves for individual components. So before we get say started, I wanna talk about LiPo safety really quick. First of all, read the entire article and watch the video that's down in the description on LiPo safety because this, what I'm saying right now, is not uh, comprehensive. Uh, LiPo batteries can be dangerous. It's really important that you uh, handles these with care, charge them properly, store them properly, don't leave them in high temperatures, charge them when you get them because they are shipped at storage charge, and always use a LiPo alarm. This is one of the batteries that we sell that you can buy bundled with the Proton Pack. We also sell a charging and LiPo safety bundle, which includes a basic charger, a LiPo storage and charging bag, and a LiPo alarm. I highly recommend these three and the battery option for those who are newer to this hobby and may not already have the batteries or chargers. I had a recommendation from one of our viewers of one of our videos that uh, said that he would love it to see us talk about LiPo safety at the beginning of every video that involves a LiPo. So we're gonna do that from now on, but I can't slot a five, eight or 10 minute video in the beginning of each tutorial. So you'd really need to watch that other video and read the documentation. We'll leave that as, as it is. Um, as always, we do not take liability for your misuse or handling of these batteries. Next, we're gonna talk about the tools and supplies that you will need to bring, assuming that you bought the DIY kit from us. Now, you're of course going to need a soldering iron, um, you're going to need solder and potentially solder tip cleaner. I also like to have a spray bottle for wetting this sponge. I tend to use the sponge more than anything. You're gonna need wire strippers or an X-Acto knife. You don't have to use wire strippers. You can definitely get by with an X-Acto knife or a cheaper wire stripper. Um, a heat gun is also very helpful. Uh, this is also not totally required. You could get along with just using the side of the soldering iron and this is simply for um, the heat shrink shrinkage. Uh, next, as far as tools and supplies, you are going to need some thread locker. You are going to need an M2.5 millimeter driver or a, also known as an Allen wrench or an Allen key. And that's for our metric three millimeter across the board uh, screws. You're also going to need a um, small screwdriver or any regular small Nerf screwdriver will do just fine. And that's just for these two screws right here that happen to be a little different. Uh, lastly, you'll want some super lube or any kind of lubricant that is plastic safe. Uh, we sell several options on the site as well, but this is not included with the kit. Wanted to make that clear. You will also need either an eight millimeter socket wrench or an eight millimeter wrench to tighten down the uh, top nut on the brushless motor. Now, if you don't have that, don't worry. You can use a large pliers and get along with the same thing. It's self-tightening, so it's a really hard thing to actually screw up, but I will be using this in the video. Optionally, you may also see me use this to drive in a lot of the hardware, but uh, this is the same 2.5 hex driver that's on the Allen key version. So just keep that in mind. This is pretty much the same thing. It's just when we assemble a lot of them here, we want to do it efficiently and um, with as little wrist strain as possible because building hundreds of blasters at a time or hundreds of kits definitely takes some time. Lastly, I do think you're going to want um, uh, helping hands. You can probably do this whole mod without them, but they are really, really uh, helpful. <laughs> I laugh every time I make that joke. <laughs> Next, I'm going to go over all of the 3D printed parts so you can know and familiarize yourself with what you're working on. Uh, this is what we consider the body. This is the main body of the Proton Pack, which everything connects to. This is the base plate, and the base plate has an integrated battery door that just slides up from the bottom. There is a, an impeller, which is essentially your fan that produ produces the pressure to blow the balls down the tube and into your blaster. You've got a lid, which fits right here. And you've got a snorkel, which is essentially the top portion of the lid. This allows you to use a, the same hose from the feeding here. You can cut off a section of that and have it bring fresh air into your pack in the case that you put this entire assembly inside a backpack which may not provide you with enough airflow. I'll talk about that at final 
final assembly. Next up, we've got the swivel connector. This is how we connect the hose from the proton pack to the actual body unit itself. These same swivel connectors are also used on the adapter side. So here I've got the Jupiter to show off. Here we've got a Jupiter adapter. It's got that same swivel so that both ends are pretty much identical. We have a number of different adapters. There's a separate video you can watch that we will link in the description that just features all the differences between the adapters because that video will get updated more frequently than a tutorial will. But essentially we've got six or seven blasters either done or planned that this can adapt to. In addition to this standard swivel, we also do offer two other variants. This one is a 90 degree swivel and this is a 90 degree dual swivel. And what I mean by dual is that not only can it swivel along the uh, 90 degree axis, but it also can rotate here. This is used in the Percy's adapter and it's included in that with that adapter. Uh, it will also likely be part of the uh, Zeus adapter as well. Lastly, on the 3D printed parts, we've got our hose clips. Now these allow you to uh, clip the wire on your hose and use as a guide. Here you can see them on the final hose where they help corral your wire. Moving on from the 3D printed parts, I'm gonna run you through all the hardware and motors and other components that are included in this kit. It's good to verify that you have received everything properly. Obviously, if you have not, please email us immediately. We will always take care of you. You as our customers are our absolute most important goal every single day. So starting with hardware, the brass inserts are going to come pre-installed. So one thing you're going to want to check right when you start is that you've got two brass inserts up here and that you have five more on the bottom. We pre-install these because we've got a special tool for it, a soldering iron all set up for it. And we thought it reduced the margin of any potential error for someone that hasn't done those before since we've done hundreds if not thousands of them at this point. You're also going to find that inside this auger there should be three screws in the bottom and you'll either find 20 millimeter screws here or you will have 20 millimeter screws separately. There are also a number of 10 millimeter screws and a number of six millimeter screws along with square nuts if they're not installed in here. An M2.5 by uh, eight millimeter screw which is a small screw. This is only for the XT60 mountable connector. We'll get to that later. And then you'll have four small, usually black screws that are also in that six millimeter length that will be used for the uh, motor, the brushless motor. Now I'm not telling you the quantities and stuff here. I would really recommend that you take the sheet, printed sheet that comes with the kit and verify that you got everything that is on there because we may alternate, you know, what hardware is pre-installed versus not installed for what's whatever's the most uh, fluid for here at the shop. For instance, here's this ring. We think we're probably gonna ship this with the hardware and the square nuts already installed. That way it's just easier for you guys because really at the end of the day, like dropping those in and putting those in is almost as much work as, it's about the same amount of work as bagging up the hardware. So we figure we might as well do the little extra for you guys if, if possible. But again, those things may change over time. So do refer to the list that you'll get with your kit. Next, you'll receive a four foot section of hose. This is more than enough hose for even a six foot five person to fully extend their arm from a backpack position. We generally find that you'll actually only need three or three and a half feet. So four feet should be plenty. Um, We'd love to hear from you if for some reason that's not enough, but uh, we found this to be a good length. Most of you will want to shorten this. There's no reason to make the hose any longer than you need it. And the same hose can be used for the snorkel portion to let fresh air into your blower. On the motor side, we've got two different motors. First, you're gonna have a very heavy duty 37D gear motor. This is 150 RPM, insane amount of torque. It's a very, very powerful motor. It's what drives this whole system to be such high rate of fire. And in addition to that, you're also gonna see a brushless blower motor. This is what's going to power your actual uh, blower itself. And then a speed control that's going to power the motor, or drive the motor. Controlling both of those items is our custom PCB. This is the Proton Pack driver board. And this allows you to very easily solder everything up and makes assembly much, much easier. So the whole assembly is built around this core. And this is the number one delay in getting the Proton Pack out and released because we wanted this to be right. And I wanted the features this has, like the current sensing. The coolest thing about this setup 
in my opinion, is that once you're done wiring all of this, you don't need to rewire your blasters to make it work. You just plug the pack directly into your XT60 on your existing modded 3S blasters, such as a Jupiter, a Perseus, a, a Hera, or um, you know perhaps a Zeus or a Chaos. And uh, I think that's really uh, makes it a lot easier. You should have two sizes of heat shrink, one small one for wires and two larger ones, which are to put over your XT60 connectors just to make a nice clean installation. You should also receive a JST connector. And I wanna make sure that you understand that this is actually optional. Um, this plugs into the board here and it allows you to just switch the board manually. This is sort of for more custom builds. For most users, I would just wire your blaster to your blaster and let the current sensing do the work. But in the case that you had a reason to manually switch this, this is what you would use, and you would probably, you know, splice this on to existing wires. Um, my buddy Ryan is putting together a uh, rival burn that will feature this. He's going to embed a switch in the rival burn, which will connect to here, and I'm hoping to do that same build myself once he's done his, because that would be sweet. <laughs> but this is essentially not essential or used in a standard build out. There are three XT60 connectors, a male-female standard pair, and a uh, XT60 EM, which is a mountable connector. And this is going to go inside your base. And this is how your blaster is going to plug in here so you can unplug the blaster tether when desired without taking the whole base plate off. Lastly, I want to note that the LiPo is not included, the Jupiter is not included, ammo is not included, the container is only included if you ordered it or selected it. That is the default that we are expecting people to do. We put these... Oh, there's a blooper. That was fun. We put these containers, you can just leave that in there, whatever. <laughs> um, these containers are what we think is a really great size. It's 450 rounds, including what's in the hose, which is about 25, 30 rounds. So we feel this is a really good solid loadout for most people and it will fit in a small backpack for your average user. Now we would love to see you go wild. So if you build something amazing and you use like the, the glue on plate and you've got some crazy container, we really want to see it. I think that's it. So without further ado, let's clean this mess up and we're gonna get right to it. We're gonna start here by assembling the motors and getting them installed. So we're gonna take our base plate and flip that upside down and we're going to take our brushless motor here. We're gonna unthread this. It's worth noting this is backwards threaded because it tightens on itself. There's one large hole down in here which these wires need to thread through. It's the largest hole that's in here it should be fairly obvious because once you shove it inside, it'll come out right there. And hopefully that's pretty understandable. There's nothing to do wrong here, so you're just getting that lined up. Then you're going to flip this back over and hold this with your finger. And you're going to take your four black screws and install them in the four holes there. Now, because this motor moves around a lot and has a tremendous amount of torque, we are going to recommend that you put thread locker on it. Um, I'm already going to abandon using this little 2.5 mil. There's nothing wrong with doing this. I've just done enough of these and I don't want the video to take longer to film. I'm gonna go ahead and use my actual um, driver tool. Uh, another tip here is that we use these slipper clutch ones. So if you ever do get one of these, buy one that has the, the amazing um, you know, adjustable torque. So it's nice, we can kind of like tune in uh, exactly where we want them as far as install torque. It's worth noting, you should never use a regular drill like a, a standard drill for construction work because even the lowest setting is gonna be way too much torque for these little motors. So we're gonna put one little drop on each of these and we're gonna start by putting them in here. After I've got them all in, you can go ahead and tighten them up. These don't need to be wrenched really tight. Uh, the Loctite will help make sure they don't vibrate themselves loose as you are using this. And there we have it. So that's the install of that. You can then pass these wires down through under this little wire channel. And that's just enough to keep that out of your way later. 
just like that. And you can tuck those in for now, but we're gonna flip back around. We're gonna take our gear motor and we're gonna put that up through the center. Should be pretty obvious. It only, it's got a little bit of play left to right due to how the design tapers on the actual motor. But once you get that in, you're good there. After you've got that motor inside, I recommend setting this on the base here so you're not scraping anything, but you will need to start at least one screw to get this going. Um, each of these should get a little bit of Loctite so you can uh, put a little thread locker on there. Loctite's a brand. Uh, you may hear me use them in interchangeable, but it's all thread locker. We've got a couple options on the site. And then if you want to avoid damaging your tabs, it's kind of nice to just set this on the base there because that's what it's designed for. So I'm going to go ahead and get the other six motors put in. Once I've got them all in, I'm gonna tighten them up, just make sure that they're good. You can hear my little um, clutch actually engaging there, making sure that I'm not putting too much torque on them. So after we've got those two installed, those motors are ready to go. The Loctite is not totally necessary here, but I would hate to think of that working itself loose as it's working and working and working and grinding and pushing through balls and whatnot. Next, we're going to install our blower. This is the actual blower fan. And you're going to want to line up these two tabs here on the inside with two notches. It doesn't matter which two notches. And there is a witness mark, as I would call it, out here. There's like a little, little tiny circle right here and a little circle right here that lines up with those notches. So you can just look at from the top, you kind of want to line up. I hope that's clear. You want to line up basically that little gap right there or that little gap right there on both sides with the little, little tiny dots that are there. And it doesn't have to be quite perfect, but there is a, just a general alignment because then it'll seat and lock. And if you feel it kind of click at the end, you've done it right. And there's another indicator here that'll tell you you've done it right. I like to just hold the nut and spin this clockwise from this perspective. And then you're gonna take your uh, either eight millimeter wrench, or again, you could just grab on here with a larger pliers and make that work as well. And you're gonna tighten it further. And you can do this just by spinning the actual, holding this in place and spinning. You'll feel it get tighter. That's when you know you're, you're good. The top of that shaft is just barely, maybe one millimeter going to break the surface of that nut. And that's when you know you've got that right. And you can give that a few spins and it should feel nice and smooth. I'm trying to keep the build order here fairly specific. And the reasoning for this is that if you don't do it in the right order, um, you'll end up fighting components more than you would like. So next we're going to move on to the fan cover and the snorkel. Now, the fan cover has two methods of operation. The first is you can simply pop this in and take two of your 10 millimeter screws and screw them in and you're done. This is great if you're going to have this external on the outside of a pack, like say mounted to a Molly frame or a backpacking you know, external frame pack or something cool like that. The second way to do it is to use the snorkel. Now the snorkel comes in two parts and it interfaces with the lid. So if you were to do this way and you didn't want to use the snorkel, you'll notice that there are two sort of holes here that if you look closely, you can actually see a little light through them. And the reasoning there is that that actually is a breakaway hole. It's just a single layer, or maybe it was two layers, I think, but Assuming you want to do the snor you don't want to, want to do the snorkel, just put this in, two 10 millimeter screws, which are these ones here, screw them in, you're done, right there and there. And that's it for that. But if you want to do the snorkel, first thing you're gonna to have to do is actually push those holes open. So from this side, you can basically, with a screw, you could actually use one of the screws if you wanted, you're just gonna break those little, little things open. You're gonna grab two of your 20 millimeter screws, which are the longest ones, and you're going to thread these up from the bottom. And they may be a little tight the first time they go in. There we go. Just do that little interface plastic there that is uh, present from that little bridge that I did to allow this to be one part. I was attempting to have fewer pieces 
uh, in, in, in the whole assembly. Now there's nothing wrong with using this variant right here, just closing it up, screwing these in and just using that on the external of a pack too, if you like the look of that on there. I think it kind of looks fun, a little industrial looking. That's just fine. But otherwise, the general intention here is that you can take your hose and seat it in here like so, just as long as it gets past those two ribs. You're gonna take some of the hose. And this is just a small section of your hose. Uh, generally, you'd probably have like six to 12 inches. And you'll, you'll close this down and then you'll screw this on. So I'm gonna do this method since this one is going to end up inside a backpack in this case. So I'm gonna build it that way. So there you can see those are flush. We've got that coming out and I'm going to cut off a small section with my knife. Since this is gonna sit inside of a pack, it doesn't have to be that long. I'm thinking about there, but you may want to wait to do this part until the end. So don't go cutting along with me now. I would recommend that you potentially just install this and then come, come back to it later. And the reasoning is you wanna see how, long, how much hose you actually need for your backpack first, if you're gonna put it inside of a backpack. And that'll give you the opportunity to actually test fit that first and then take the excess and use it for here. There should be enough for both. Uh, next, we're gonna put our two 10 millimeter screws. Get in your home. These threaded inserts have a fair amount. They can take a fair amount of force, but don't go drilling on them with a power drill or something like that. They might cause you some issues there. Next, we're gonna move on to soldering. So before we install this auger, we're actually going to flip this upside down and work. This shaft does go above the flat base here. So you're gonna to wanna to find maybe two pieces of wood or two pieces of anything that you can set this on. If you don't have that, you also can take your base and you can sort of maneuver this to sit still. The, the idea is you basically just need something to hold it um, relatively steady so you can solder on it. It'll make your life a little bit easier. So try in uh, keeping faith and trying to, trying to work with exactly what you'd have, I'm gonna set it on here and see how that works. It'll be worth, worth trying. We're gonna grab our PCB. That's going to be our first component that we are going to solder on, and that's gonna drop in place right here. Um, it's worth noting this is not going to go through this hole. It's going to just sit right on it, and it'll keep this at the perfect distance away from the unit itself. So you're gonna drop that on there. Don't forget to grab your safety glasses, and uh, we can get soldering. So here I've got some lead-free solder. I never use leaded solder anymore, and uh, we're gonna go ahead and get this board going. Um, you don't need to go too crazy. You don't actually have to fill the hole, the entire hole or anything like that, but there is a, a, you know, a plastic piece there on the motor that will stop you from doing it going down and causing any actual damage. Um, if you do not have a fresh tip or your soldering iron isn't very strong, this board has a lot of copper in it, so it is going to take some additional heat and time on here just uh, Make sure to keep your hot soldering iron far away from any other, any other component there. I'm actually gonna flex that a little bit longer. And when you're done, as it's cooling, make sure that your board sits reasonably level. I think this one could be, basically should just be nice and flat. I'm gonna adjust it just a hair. I'm gonna hold it there. So we are gonna grab some of our heavy gauge wire. This is 14 gauge. This is what comes with the kit. Um, 14 gauge is technically overkill for a lot, but with the five foot, nearly five foot run, maybe four foot run going to the pack, there is a little bit of a voltage loss there. So we wanted to have this be as easy as possible. So again, we're gonna do the blaster terminal and everything is marked as positive and negative. Uh, the, there are multiple ways to solder to these, but I like to do it without the helping hands whenever possible. So I will just um, connect them in directly. Just basically put them part way into this terminal just to, you can see how long that is. It's like not as long, not even as long as my fingernail, maybe 10 millimeters or so less. And then just give it a little twist as it goes in. And that will actually hold it right there without helping hands. Uh, anytime I can not set helping hands up, as long as I can do a good job, it's just faster. 
and you're gonna solder right to these pads. Now, these pads are designed to solder directly to the surface. You don't have to insert it in. You can simply um, solder to the surface and just have, a, have your connector hold the, uh, you can just have your uh, uh, helping hands hold that in place. And with all soldering, I mean, the, the biggest tips are make sure your soldering iron is, is well cared for, take care of your tips, replace them more frequently than you probably think you need to, though it really depends on how much you abuse them and leave them on when not in use. All right, so that's it for that side. While we're here, I'm gonna go ahead and solder in our ESC power. And I think with the length of this, I'm going to need to strip just a little bit. Nope, and I stripped too much. This is ultimately gonna sit right down in here, so keep that in mind. You might be able to get away with a little bit shorter. I might actually trim these up. Not super important, but I'm going to cut a hair off of each of these in order to get to about the length I want. You don't have to do this again. You could just take the, the, the bare leads that were pre-tinned there nicely. I mean, it's always nice, but... Now, the ESC power literally doesn't do anything. It's just a convenient place for you to solder. There's nothing, nothing magic about ESC power. I'm sure someone's asking, why is there an ESC power? Um, <laughs> but there really is no reason. I mean, there is a reason. It's, I didn't want people to have to splice, merge, and deal with that sort of thing. And since these are a lighter gauge wire, they are gonna slip a little bit more out of there, but I'm still gonna do the same method. Again, you could get your helping hands in here and you could use those instead, but I'm not going to in this case because this is faster. You don't want to shove too much wire down through because there are other pads on the side, back of the board. There's nothing that you should be interfering with, but just never have any more extra wire sticking out than, than necessary. There's just no point. And with all soldering, you know, you're looking for that nice, smooth, smooth look to it where everything is fully flux, so you don't get a cold solder joint or anything like that. If you want to, you can plug your ESC plug in now. The terminals are marked. Ground is on the far right here, so that is your black. And I don't think you'll need to, but optionally, if you ever have a problem with this coming off of here, you can just put a dab of hot glue right here to, to hold that connector in place. Hot glue is very safe in that, that regard, but I'm not going to do it because I haven't actually had a problem with them coming off yet. Next, we're gonna solder on the battery terminal. While we're here, we might as well finish everything up. I'm gonna take two lengths of wire and I'm going to measure them. I want this XT60 connector to end up somewhere out here. This is for your battery, so it's going to be tucked back in. It's nice when you have enough room to turn it around and tuck it back in versus like having to kind of shove. But I'll leave this up to you as far as length. I would generally go maybe an inch or two longer than the end here. I'm gonna start with two extra, basically two inches past here, uh, you know, five centimeters for those of you who aren't using our rather silly system. And so we are going to strip a couple more pieces of wire, about that same eight to 10 millimeter length. My engineer James is amazing. He put in a lot of work on this board and I am so thrilled to have a just wildly uh, technical savvy person because as much as I wanna learn all the programming and everything, there's just so much going on in the business that it is not possible for me to spend the amount of time necessary to, to actually um, you know, get really well versed in all of that. Um, so he, huge thank you to him for making this happen and making this um, product a reality. Because seriously, without him, we wouldn't have the cool board. The features would not be as good. I might have got it out earlier because I wouldn't have waited for doing the extra component, but I don't think it would have been as cool. <laughs> this has been such like a 
pain point for me because I've wanted this done for so long, but in the time that this project's been going on, I had, had two kids, I moved, I moved the shop twice, and I hired seven employees. Um, if that's not enough to deal with, I don't know what is. Um, so at that point, we're actually done with the soldering on the PCB itself. We're gonna move on to the connectors, the two XT60 connectors for these two, and we'll connect the brushless motors here to the ESC. All right, next we're going to wire up our ESC, and this requires a little bit of organization because there are three wires that come out of the three-phase ESC, and they're gonna to connect to these three here. Now, the first thing I want you to do is uh, peel this logo off because you're going to want to make sure that you are working with the MOSFETs down. There are six MOSFETs here. We're gonna flip those over, whatever's most natural for how your wiring is going. In my case here, it lines up perfectly, so it looks pretty good. Then we're gonna grab our helping hands, and uh, helping hands is gonna stand on top of the proton, uh, proton there. And uh, don't wanna to clamp too hard since you are clamping on electronics there, but there is a um, sheath over the top of uh, plastic. So next, we've got um, three wires here, um, one, two, three, and they're gonna go exactly in order, one, two, three. So I hope that's clear. You're going to need to kind of retrace. This is my first wire, this is my second wire, and that's my third. So that's in order that they come out at this orientation, and they're gonna solder on directly there. Now, I'm gonna shorten these up a little bit. So I'm actually gonna pull this guy out for a moment while I uh, clip these three. You can clip them, clip about an uh, inch or two and a half uh, centimeters off. I don't know why I'm doing metric and standard today, but you know, it's just that kind of kind of mode. I design 100% in metric in case anybody's ever curious. Um, just 0 0.0052 inches just doesn't have the same level of precision I want as, and. Um, I, it's easier to identify metric. It's just so much simpler. This isn't 100% necessary, but I'm gonna cut three small pieces of heat shrink and I'm gonna put one on each wire. Why not do it extra right? For me, I f always feel like it's so much better to just do it right the first time, avoid any potential mistakes later. So we're going to take that first wire and we're going to go ahead and solder that on. Always a little tricky to illustrate and let you see what I'm doing. I'm going to punch in. We're going to get you a closer view here, hopefully. All right, so I've got that lined up just on the pad. doesn't need to be any longer than that. And we're going to go ahead and solder that up. Now these contain a fair amount of copper, so you are gonna to have to um, sit and wait for it to heat up and flux. You'll see it happen, it'll slowly suck up that solder onto that nice pad. There we go, there's number one done. Always make sure that you're either blowing on this or letting this cool. When I'm not doing a tutorial for a video, we do use a little um, um, filter filter box solder thing. Kind of hard to show on camera, but it just has an activated charcoal filter. Um, Greg, one of our team members here, had uh, suggested picking one of those up, and it was definitely a good good purchase. Though I do use lead-free solder. I'll do the second one here. These will take a little longer than you would think. It's kind of like here where you've got a lot of copper in the component. You don't want to overheat them because you could fry something out. And that looks cool. And then we'll take our third one. I just made myself nervous that I flipped them around. Again, it should be one, two, three, and one, two, three. I really hope that makes sense to everybody watching. Um, if you're watching and uh, you're not actually building this, leave me a note in the comments. Let me know if that, that actually made sense to you because we are really trying to work. Um, if you haven't noticed already, a lot more work is going into these videos. Uh, we have uh, a great editor, Perry, here now, who's been not only helping me out uh, with the edits, but helping out on set, 
and, it, and keeping me on schedule to make sure we actually get videos done every each week. <laughs> because as videos are like my favorite thing to do, um, and a lot of times they just get relegated to the back burner because it just gets busy. So there, we're good to go. Um, after that's cooled, I do, especially on these, because there's a lot of copper there, give them a nice little tug. Make sure that they don't look like they're going anywhere. And we can unstrap that guy. So now I'm gonna go ahead and put the, push this heat shrink up here, which will make it look nice and clean. And I'm gonna take my little heat gun here. Awesome. From there, we can actually go ahead and tuck this whole speed control down under inside there and then tuck the wires down in with it so it should sit like that when it's done. If any is sticking up above, don't worry about it. It's not going to cause any problems because there's plenty of room in here. That little tab here that's sort of very, very thin is just there to keep that from popping out. And then when you put the base plate in, it pushes down on the top of here down to the level of this channel. Next, we're going to wire up our XT60 connector for the battery. I've gone ahead and pre-stripped these two leads. I like to take the battery connector and just partially connect them. That'll help keep them from deforming, and you can then connect them, hold them together. Um, I'll try to do this the best I can on camera. Flat side is always positive, so get used to that. We're going to cut two more pieces of heat shrink, probably about two centimeters, a little under an inch. It's not too specific, about like that'll do. And we're gonna slide those down. I said this in many videos, but good habit is anytime you cut a, cut a wire, throw heat shrink on it. You strip a wire, heat shrink, no matter what. Even if you don't think you need it. Because more often than not than you do, and if you have to resolder, it takes more time than just throwing it on there. So we're gonna get this all the way down in here. Okay, that guy's causing too many problems. We're gonna go a little lower here. Trying to do this at an angle so you can see it. We're actually gonna do three XT60s in this in this video because we've got two on the base and one on one, two, three. Actually, I think we have four. Two on the base and one on the uh, and two on the wire. I was looking at the monitor there. I actually did something bad. I actually melted the little corner of that connector, but not to worry. As long as we didn't do you know, terrible damage, it's not gonna be a big deal. And I'll generally slide the heat shrink down just when, to help allow for uh, uh, starting to melt that heat shrink for me. So now we'll do the second one. It's a, it's a skill to watch a video screen and make your hands work. And I have to watch the video screen because I have to make sure you can all see what I'm doing. But it's definitely a weird, weird skill I'm slowly getting better at. All right, and then we will heat shrink that. I'm just gonna heat shrink as we go today. I may fast forward through this in the later parts of the video because I'm gonna do the same thing three times, but I like to take a piece of heat shrink, stretch it a little bit, just enough to fit over this connector and then cover this. Oh, didn't stretch it enough. I stretch it rather than choosing a larger heat shrink size because you get more shrink total. And then we'll heat shrink that. And this just gives the, the protect the little bit of uh, protection there. Not required at all. And so I will do that same process for the two connectors for the actual proton pack wire that goes all the way to your blaster. Both ends of that have an XT60, so um, we'll do, do that later. So that's it for the battery, that's it for the ESC. Lastly, we have the blaster. Now, as I mentioned before, I like to route this kind of in a strange method because 
We're going to want to be able to take this off in case you ever want to get inside here for some reason, or you want to adjust the settings on the trim pots or potentially add a switch or something. Now we could simply wire this like right here, you know, directly like super close, but then this can't be set down on the surface. And so I'm going to bump out a little wider here and I'll show you kind of what I intend to do. So I want to make it so that this flops out like that, but the wire runs around and down. So I'm essentially going to take these two wires, kind of do a little loop like this and have them come, come to that connection. It is technically adding a little bit of wire, but then when you want to service it, you can pretty easily get back into it. Um, if you'd rather do it the other way where it's a little more difficult to open this, but you use less wire, that's fine too. Nothing wrong with it. So we're going to take and, and cut these. And I am not going to heat shrink these connectors because they are, um, no, that's not true. I'm going to heat shrink them. Like I said, heat, sh heat shrink every time you, every time you do it, right? We'll make these a little bit shorter, maybe uh, 15 millimeters or 18 millimeters. <laughs> I'm actually getting pretty good at guessing uh, lengths of different objects that are in that small space because I spent a lot of time working with small hardware and things in 3D, 3D software. Procedure is very much the same here. And again, it's still positive to positive, negative to negative. Positive is always the flat side. However, I did get a bad XT60 connector once from like a knockoff brand. It was the last time I ever bought um, a knockoff was was after it was, uh, what was it? It was, oh, it was like the ESC. Some, some component I had had an XT60 and it was wired backwards. Something I bought that way. And I'm not talking like a small creator. It was like from China. And again, we'll slide that connector down and we'll do the negative. I always like to give it a good little twist. I'm sorry for those of you that um, are now like watching this and having to fast forward. The overwhelming uh, opinion has been that people would prefer to see every step. If I don't put every single step in here, I get emails and I get emails that happen over and over and over. So I'm trying to be very, very specific and intentional about always showing you literally every portion. So I'm not going to, um, we're not going to fast forward too much in the build unless it's very, very, very obvious. Cause I just don't want, um, I don't want people to have such a bad experience like that. So for some of you veterans that are just following to see the wiring and whatnot, um, sorry to make you wait. I'm going to, I think Drac's going to stream this, uh, stream his assembly, which should be hilarious because he likes to not watch the video or look at any of the documentation. <laughs> so he frequently, it doesn't have the info quite right. Um, I'm gonna go ahead here now and uh, just heat shrink that up. Heat shrink it up. <laughs> I'm gonna melt the heat shrink that is. And then we're gonna go ahead and we can actually install this guy in here. There's no, no magic about it, but it is gonna come kind of around like that. Uh, so I'm going to just sort of mimic that same shape. And uh, yeah, so we're gonna plug this in Pretty straightforward. You might want to let yours cool a little more than I did. This is hot. And a backwards, you know, prob probably. <laughs> there we go. So that should fit nice and snug and almost feel like it could stay on its own. However, it definitely does not or should not stay on its own. So you're going to take your two smallest screws that you've got. And these are the only Phillips screws in the kit currently. They do not make these in the right size. Um, I could not find them in the right size that I wanted to, to do this without this. Um, I wanted them to be a little more flush and there's a limited space. So you can see like that's reasonably flush. If I had used the um, normal hex ones of the same variety, they stuck out more and it just seemed more clunky. So I opted for these. As much as possible, I always try to keep the hardware the same across everything. So everything uses the same tool. The only exception is this one piece. 
Oh, and maybe you'll do what I did. I just knocked this little uh, itty bitty, uh, uh, really, really tiny uh, screw or uh, hex nut. So that just goes in the back of this connector uh, right here. So hopefully I can get my large fingers in there. And you can just make that snug. No need for Loctite or anything like that. It's not, not going anywhere. It only has to resist. And now you got that nice flush look. I, I think it's just, just stellar. All right, now we have finished the internal wiring with the XT60, the blaster connection, and the ESC. Uh, I'm going to close up the bottom, but I'm not actually going to screw the screws in because we want to make sure everything's working when we get it finally wired up and connected to a blaster. Um, so I wouldn't recommend putting all the screws in quite yet. Just wait till the very end for that. So this is going to kind of coil around. Uh, the highest point in this PCB is this little black connector right here for the ESC control. So if you find you're having any, that if anywhere there's uh, too little room, that would be it. But what that lets you know is that the wire, as long as the wire sits below that, you're good. And then we're gonna go ahead and close everything up. And then of course the wire on this side needs to go kind of underneath those uh, capstan for the, the, wire, the screws. This is like a uh, nearly impossible to show on camera. But once you've got it. Oh, I hate that that's. There we go. Okay. And then you should be closed up and you should have a, a solid seam all the way around if there's nothing interfering. And I would leave it like that for now because we will get back to the battery door at the end when we're actually ready to test. Next, we're going to put on our auger, and the auger takes two 20 millimeter screws that are, those are two of the long ones. You're going to thread them in here and here. Before you do that, look down the center of this hole and make sure that it looks clear. You will see little metal bits. We have pre-installed the square nuts. Now, there's a chance that they might shift. We made this hole nice and tight, so they stay down on the bottom, so they should. But just make sure that when you look through this hole, Kind of hard to see, but you should be able to see a little light through that hole. So 20 millimeter on both sides. You're going to want to pre-thread these part way. And go gentle and slowly on this one. This one has two. Um, you'll feel it tighten up. You may need to loosen up and um, kind of back it in and out just for a second. And in this case, I actually probably need a little more torque. I've got this set a little, a little too low. And this side, and you, what you're looking for is you want to put it most of the way inside, but not into that hole there. And you can just basically watch until you see it in the hole, and then you can back it out. So once you've got your two screws in there, and they're just pulled out so that that center column is open, you're going to want to take the side that says 20 millimeter with the two holes and line it up to this face here. And once you've done that, you can basically push it all the way down. You should feel it snap, and there should be a pretty obvious you're at the base. You also can know that you are have done it correct in that the ball should roll freely all the way around. And there should be a, a, a millimeter and a half above, approximately a millimeter and a half, if you want to get specific, above the actual thing. Um, and... Uh, You'd be shocked how little of a difference ver up and down the spacing and all of that made to the actual flow rate of the balls. Next, we're going to set up our hose. And this is kind of getting to the fun part. Um, we're kind of doing a couple things all at once. You know, we haven't finished putting this together because we want to make sure it's fully functioning before we lock it up. But here we've got the two halves of our connectors. You're going to take two of your M10 M3 by 10 millimeter screws. They're the medium sized ones that are in the bundle. Uh, we like to give these a little bit of, of lubricant right inside here. So that's where the lubricant comes into play. Any, any of these joints you do, you're gonna to wanna to do that. Now the reason for the lube, lubricant is really all about uh, the, uh, the, the fit. Uh, ultimately, we want 
little to no air leak coming out of these because the airflow in the system is important. So if you find that any of these are binding at all, just give them a, a nice uh, couple turns. There are occasionally, you know, little bits of, of 3D printed stuff here. If you just kind of grind it around a few times or during actual use, it'll clean up, but you can kind of distribute that lubricant a little bit around. And if you find you're having any issues, just force the, um, the uh, pieces apart. And uh, so we're gonna put the lubricant in there. We're going to set one of these in here so that it's in properly. And then we're gonna close that together. That should be relatively obvious. I can... With the rigidity of this hose, uh, the swivel connections were absolutely essential. You'll feel it as you're putting it together. And this is why we didn't do the hose before soldering because normally I would do the physical assembly first, but it, it just gets in the way. And there we go. And as I said, you know, that may, might feel a little stiff as you start, you can give it a few extra turns, but it will loosen up uh, very quickly to where now it's um, just should move you should be able to very easily push it around. Now, given I do have the hose over here, uh, the rest of the hose fighting it, but great. So there we've got our blaster side. And the reason we wanted to do that first is we wanted to estimate the length that we will need for our XT60 connector. So the next part here is you're gonna take your hose, hose length and you're gonna to wanna to get this to match. And so what I like to do is we're gonna solder one end of the connector, we're gonna plug that in, then we're gonna run our cable clips, and then we're gonna make our other connection at the end. It seems like a lot of extra steps, but the last thing you want is like a bunch of ugly extra wire. Now, should you want to, I made this red and black to make it easier on assembly. You could make these both black. Um, we are gonna use our clips here. You know, I think doing both black might look nice. You just have to keep track of your polarity and make sure you wire it correctly. But I'll leave that all up to you. We include both colors in the kit for simplicity of wiring. So now we're gonna wire up the, the pack connector to pack connect the pack to the XT60s on the unit itself and to your blaster. So we're gonna put heat shrink as usual. And we're going to uh, grab our connectors here and do yet another XT60. We'll start with the end that connects to the pack that allows us to trim the other one to get it to a reasonable length that will actually be effective for what we're doing. Not too long, not too short. And again, I'm gonna do my same little trick here. Adds a little strain relief too, which is nice. More or less though, I just like that it looks a little more pro. <laughs> we also do sell the XT60 connectors with the caps on the back, but I haven't found them necessary. Now that I've got this XT60 connector wired, we're actually going to plug it in. And I'm gonna give a little bit of an extra strain relief here, something about like that give it a few extra inches, and then I'm gonna start actually connecting my hose clamps. And these just connect right on the surface like that. Um, you can leave as much or as little slack here as you like. It's kind of up to you, depending on whether this will end up inside your a pack or outside. And then I'm gonna follow down this hose, placing them uh, approximately even, evenly based on how many I have. I have seven, so I'm gonna kind of eyeball this. I might end up you know, fixing them again a little bit later, but we'll just keep working our way down. You kind of spread them. They're very tight, but they should be. And for my own neuroses, I like to keep them parallel. <laughs> we will be including a few extras in case anybody uh, catches these or breaks them on anything. Uh, we're Hard to play test stuff like this. We've done our best to, you know, assume 
durability levels, etc. But uh, you know, it's, we won't know how people abuse everything and how hard you all play until uh, it comes back. So now that we're to this point, I'm actually going to connect my Jupiter adapter. And the reason I'm going to do this is it lets me really know that I've got the right length um, hose. And this might take a little finessing. You're going to want to make sure that you get this the optimal length. There's a really big difference between six inches too long or six inches too short when it comes down to the final feel of the pack on your back and how that the actual hose will fight you when you're when you're moving around and stuff. So. I would encourage you to figure out your max range of motion you need with your primary hand and with your blaster and cut the tube shorter to match that. Don't keep extra foot or two for no reason because it'll just get in your way. And this connector is just like the other end. So now that we've got dual swivel, we swivel, we swivel back here and we swivel over here. So your final hose setup should look something like this. And now since we're here, you can adjust and determine where this cord is going in your individual build. Now this is going to be different for everybody. In a Jupiter, I'm going to want it about right here. So that's where I'm going to put it. I'm going to cut right here. Now we're going to do our XT60. But on another blaster, it might be completely different, such as a Percy's, depending on where you're writing, routing your actual wiring yourself. <laughs> So now I'm going to solder this last female connector that will plug into our battery. And again, red is the flat side. Definitely done those connectors incorrectly in the past where uh, got some from China that were totally mislabeled. That was the funny thing, number one. And then I think another time I, I can't, I don't, can't quite remember. I screwed up something else too, though. You don't nerf mod without making mistakes, everybody. Um, it's like the biggest thing I see. People don't want to, don't want to make mistakes so they don't get started, but you got to do it. Okay. If you're wondering why there's a jump cut there, our, uh, camera died. So we, uh, had to come back at it here again a bit later. So, And I put a heat shrink on, or missed a heat shrink. So I just had to reverse that real quick. We all make mistakes. Cool. Now in the case of Jupiter, I'm going to toss this inside my connector, though your setup may vary depending on what blaster you're using, but we're going to push that through. I've got my Jupiter blaster here. And we're going to just let that connector just kind of sit inside there, close it on up. At this point, we are completely ready to go. We just haven't closed everything up. I don't like to close everything up until I am actually sure everything has been set up and that I like the settings. And really that's just those two dials on the actual board itself. One, again, will give you uh, the actual fan speed. So whether you're getting enough feed rate coming through your, your tube. And the second is the threshold in which the current uh, uh, activates the circuit, the current detection. So we're going to take our container. In this example, I'm using this one gallon container. Again, when this is in there, it's a uh, 450 rounds, including the hose. So that'll twist into place there. And then it locks with two screws, one on either side. These do not need to be tightened very far. They are literally just stopping the unit from turning. So it's really just a few screws. And there you are. And now we're, we're locked in place. I can then go ahead and actually fill this guy up. Overexposed. And then of course you are going to need your lid. So after you've got that lid on there, then we can grab our battery and you can test it with the battery on the outside of your blaster. We are of course going to put our lipo alarm in there. Uh, Pro tip, it doesn't matter which orientation, it just has to beep. So if it doesn't work in the first one, switch it over. Second pro tip is hold a little alarm there so no one has to listen to it. Your family 
parents and other people will appreciate it. So we know that's fully charged. We're gonna go ahead and plug it in and we should hear a startup tune. That is the ESC going, so that is great. And uh, then the proof is in the pudding. We've got an empty, empty hose here and we've got the pack. I should, when I rev this up, my blaster should rev and these should rev too. So, if that happens to you, then you need to go check the uh, threshold dial. So my threshold was set too low, and all I did was just dial that up a smidge. And now I'm also going to change my fan speed, make sure that's good. There it goes. <laughs> So the left, just to show you what I'm doing there, it's kind of hard to see, but um, threshold, you've got two things to mess with there, basically. One is your threshold for the current and the other is the actual speed of the fan. So check the two things, it's always one of the two. It's kind of actually great that that happened while I was doing it because then you can kind of see the process. It's not exactly that difficult. All right, so after a little bit of tuning here, basically just adjusting the fan speed and the the threshold, it's really tiny adjustments with the screwdriver. A, uh, this is a number one screwdriver. This works perfect uh, for it, as long as it's got a newer tip. Um, you can also use a tiny, tiny flat head. But um, once you've got it dialed in, when you rev, you'll hear this, you'll see this, and then you'll hear the high-pitched whine of the, of the blower. And here we go. And then if I fire, this is bad. This is going to be messy. <laughs> So there we have it. That is a successful Proton Pack build. I am very proud of this. And uh, really the last step is to put everything back together. So we'll do that really quick. Before we actually put this back together, go ahead and pre-thread these screws. Make sure they actually go all the way in and that you get them through the... Get them all the way through. You should see them pop out the other side. While they connect into uh, brass inserts, we did keep the hole tolerance tight enough so that they wouldn't drop out on you when you unscrew them. Because the worst thing is being out in the field and, and trying to open something up or show somebody something and then you close it up and you immediately uh, ru ruin the, uh, the effect. Okay, so again, that's kind of the path of the wiring. You can kind of do it however you like, but we're gonna go ahead and uh, close everything up, try to keep the wires out. Kind of helps to look through here while you're doing this. I know you guys can't see what I'm doing. It's almost impossible to film something at this angle like this. And you want to make sure that ESC is tucked in. And then we should be good to screw everything back together. Let's see if I can get any more height. Nope. And you don't need to go crazy tight on these, so this would definitely be one for, um, shouldn't be a too, much, too much torque. And then lastly, take our last M3 by 20 screw. Again, that's one of the longest ones. And same thing, we're gonna pre-start pre that, make sure it's in there. And then the battery pretty much just inserts inside. You tuck your LiPo alarm down inside. There is tons of room in there and then you connect these. This is why you wanted that slack. And then you uh, tuck this whole thing in there. So when you push this up, you're gonna have to make sure that your battery wires are tucked in far enough so that they're not conflicting with the actual hole. A little hard to show on camera, but basically that's gotta be clear. Um, there we go. And then we're gonna close it on up. And with that, we are done. That is a final proton pack ready to fire.
wired to the blaster, ready to go. Uh, hope you enjoyed this video. These tutorials are always a lot of work. In this case, obviously this one's very much a product, so it is an accompanying part of making a product. And um, I do enjoy making the tutorial videos, but they pretty much take a whole day. And that's not even including the editing time. But uh, until next time, I'm out of darts. <laughs>